it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much for asking um, me to participate in the Montgomery County Conference. Uh, we're neighbors and we need to work together and, and preserve our past. Uh, DC used to be part of Montgomery County, so I, I, I'm sure you all appreciate that. I'm an anthropological archeologist. That is, my PhD is in anthropology. And that is the framework for how I approach and view the study of the past. Uh, so I'm here today with, uh, with Charday Reed, the assistant archeologist, and also with Christine Ames. Uh, she's a Capital City Fellow who's working on the archeological collections for the next six months. And she put together the artifact display that we have up here of some of the things that came out of the Yarrow site. So when this is all over and we get through the question and answer session, please come up and take a look at some of the things and we'll answer your questions about the artifacts. As the district's archeologist, I spend quite a lot of time making sure that properties with archeological potential um, get adequately investigated before development starts. The trick is, um, of these kinds of projects is that we can only require archeological investigations on very specific types of development projects. There has to be federal money or city funds, the land has to be federally owned or city owned. I don't even get to review or examine most development projects that are on private property. So um, we only see archeology span on very specific property types. So that's what makes the Yarrow Project so unique. This is a private property, privately owned, single family home lots, and normally that would never come to me to review for archeological potential. So um, we're, uh, what I'm going to do today is give you an overview of the project. This um, project um, is unique, first of all, because it is private, Secondly, because we're running it, our, we ran the field work ourselves. We're conducting the artifact analysis and the report writing with assistance from some others, and I'll get into that in a moment. Um, we essentially donated our staff time, Charday and I, and provided overall management and coordination. Uh, besides um, Charday and I, there was also uh, funding for an intern, uh, Mia Carey, who over the past two summers um, worked as a district leadership program intern. It's a city workforce development program, and even though it'll be uh, uh, highly unlikely we'll get, ever get a second archeologist position in the city, sorry, Charday, uh, it, it, we managed to um, use that program for a funded internship. So we had uh, Mia all summer, 40 hours a week, and she basically ran the field work portion of the project. Now, not only that, she is a uh, doctoral student at the University of Florida, and she is a National Science Foundation research fellow. So between those sources of funding, she has um, her own ability to, to travel and do research on the project in ways that we can't actually fund from the city. And she'll be doing her dissertation on this project. Now the fourth person on the project team who's listed on the slide is Charlie Lee Decker. Some of you may know him, he's a retired archeologist um, and he came on board, um, I call him our brain trust. He's the one who, who did contract archeology span in the district in this region for over 30 years and when it came time to direct the backhoe and who to use and how to do things, he backed us up and just really helped us out. Um, I, I mean, getting out there every day with a backhoe operator and with a huge crew, he was a pro and we learned so much for him, from him. And I'm so thankful that he said yes to come out um, pro bono, for free, brought us food, it was wonderful. Um, he, he kept us on task and efficient, and it was just so helpful. Now, since there was no direct agency funding, we did this pro bono, this, and the project uh, staff were all volunteers, except for Charday and I. We uh, had the support of the neighborhood um, and uh, many other people that came to visit. Uh, they donated money. 
They provided supplies. The neighbors threw the hose over the fence and allowed us to put our plug through the, the slats in the fence for electricity. Um, so it was just really a full neighborhood support of this project. And we could not have done it without their support and encouragement um, and um, fundraising. Uh, so uh, I call it a crowdsourced project. Um, so here are some of the groups that participated. Um, a lot of people came out and volunteered from all over the region. People from Montgomery County, Fairfax County, Alexandria Archaeology sent over all their volunteers one day. Some of you, I recognize some faces. Some of you came by and volunteered at the site. And so we have many, many thanks to give out. Uh, I wish we had time to thank all of them individually, but um, thank you, every one of you that came out and helped. Um, now there's one additional person I'd like to do a special shout out for, uh, Mr. Jim Johnson. He's sitting over there, and uh, Jim wrote the book on Yarrow. There's a copy of it up on the table, and he's also selling them out in the front. Um, we owe him this special debt because he's the person who called us at the Historic Preservation Office and said, do you know about Yarrow Mammut? Do you know that his property is about to be redeveloped? Now, we knew about Yarrow Mammut. We knew about the portraits that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, one of them's in the Georgetown Public Library. But we had no idea that he may have left an archeological footprint in the district. And Jim wrote a book um, about Yarrow and the descendants in Yarrow's family. And um, that was our jumping off point for this research project. And um, we would never have gotten off the ground without him and his perseverance. So thank you. Thank you, that, that's really great because a lot of these public history projects, really it, it takes someone in the, in the community to make everyone aware of what's happening, what property is about to be developed, what resources out there. And honestly, it would not have taken off without Jim's help. So now to get on to the project in Yarrow. Um, Yarrow was born in West Africa uh, approximately 1736, um, and that's according to his own sort of accounting. Um, he was enslaved there and brought by ship to Annapolis, where he was purchased by someone in the Bell family um, in 1752. He was a teenager. Um, and he was enslaved uh, for over 40 years. And um, he did a variety of tasks while a slave. Uh, one of the th um, traditions in slavery in this region is that you sometimes would take the slaves from your farm, if they were especially skilled, and send them to Georgetown to hire out for labor. And um, the Bell family did that. And Yarrow served as a stevedore loading and unloading ships at the dock, at, you know, at the port town. He was a skilled basket maker. Um, and he did a variety of other things, brick making. And so he was able to do these things. And the family earned the money that he generated. Uh, he uh, was manumitted in 1796, and that means that he was given the, his freedom by the Bell family. And the story goes that he made bricks for the mansion that they were constructing in Georgetown. It's called Evermay, it's still there. And um, the, uh, prop, the Bell family member who asked him to do this passed away before it was finished, but his son honored that promise. And so Yarrow was manumitted in 1796. He earned money on his own for several years and then purchased the freedom of his son, Akila. And eventually he was able to earn enough money doing what he did, um, brick making, and all the other trades that he worked in. And he bought this Dent Place property in Upper Georgetown in 1803. Um, the portraits um, that you see here were painted late in his life. He was very well known in Georgetown. There are many stories about him. His, he uh, used to swim in the Potomac River. And um, I got an email from someone in September saying that he is actually 
featured in the U.S. Swimming Hall of Fame in Orlando. And uh, they sent me a photograph of, his ex of the exhibit featuring him. Um, and we know these kinds of details about Yarrow because he, when he sat for the portrait by Charles Wilson Peale, and it's, oh, it's the one on your left over there. Um, in 1819, Peel um, put, uh, created a diary entry about the conversations they had uh, throughout the sitting. And um, Peel painted Yarrow's portrait because he heard that there was a gentleman in Georgetown who uh, was supposedly 140 years old, something like that. And Yarrow was nowhere near that old, but uh, when he met him, this story was so incredible about his life, the people that he met. He supposedly met George Washington while, while a slave when he was with the Bell family, um, that Peel decided to paint his portrait. And so Yarrow went to this Georgetown room and sat there for however many days it took. And you can see the portrait is just lovely. It was at the Atwater Kent Museum in Philadelphia for many years, and recently it moved to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and they paid some astronomical amount for this portrait. Um, we're going to take a field trip there uh, this spring, to our, our research team, to see it in person. Um, but you can see it's utterly lovely, uh, the, the painting and the technique. And when you compare it to the portrait next to it, that was done by a 17-year-old Georgetown artist um, who was just beginning on his career as a portraitist. And you can see the, the dramatic difference, the mature Peel and the teenage Simpson. So, but we're very proud of that one in DC because it does hang in the Georgetown Public Library if you'd like to see it, the Peabody Room. Now, one of the things that, uh, about Georgetown is that it was established before Congress established the Capitol. Uh, there in, in Washington, D.C. So it was the port town for the whole region. And Wisconsin Avenue used to be the rolling road, and that's where they would roll the tobacco barrels down to the port. So it was, it was a really important location for this area. And that means that it was, it's fairly well mapped, it was well known. And um, Yarrow, when he was able to buy his property, was not in the core of the city. Uh, the town of Georgetown, he bought a property on the fringes, what I call Upper Georgetown. It's up on the bluff looking down. It would have had a spectacular view. Uh, when the leaves are off the trees, we could see clear over to the Air Force Memorial over past the Pentagon it's, and the planes coming in and it's actually uh, quite lovely. When um, Yarrow died, he was actually buried on that pro property and um, the reason we believe that is because um, Peel liked Yarrow so much and uh, that when he heard of his death through a letter, someone sent him a letter and said, oh, Yarrow passed away, um, Peel actually uh, wrote an obituary for Yarrow and at his own expense had it published in a number of East Coast newspapers. So, uh, and in that obituary, and we'll talk about this more in a few minutes, it mentions that he might be buried in his backyard. Well, let's just say that really got us moving. Uh, the thought that he could still be buried in a backyard in Georgetown. So we jumped into full research mode. So we put together a project to focus on this lot. The, the lot is 150 feet by 35 feet. How hard can it be to find a burial in a lot that size, right? Um, and the project goals were to not only look for Yarrow, to find traces of Yarrow, but to do a community archaeology project, a public education, to engage with the neighbors and the local neighborhood. And um, there was no way we could do this ourselves. We needed that kind of community input. And the second goal was to conduct the archaeological and historical research needed to determine, did Yarrow really live there? That was the first question. Was this the property? And um, in the course of doing all of this, we ended up learning a lot about the Muslim experience in America. I think I forgot to say that when Yarrow was enslaved, he apparently was literate in Arabic. 
and the deed for that property, when he signed his name, he signed it in Arabic script. So we know he was Muslim by his name, and um, it is just a, a huge window on a subject that I did not know a lot about when we first started this. Um, it turns out, uh, depending on what expert you're talking to, uh, 15 to 30, 45 percent of the slaves that were brought over from Western Africa were Muslim. I had no idea. And so um, this, the, the research, the historical research into this project has grown in that dimension. And so not only are we doing our typical historical archaeology, looking at the past, looking at documents, but we're giving a voice to the voiceless. And not just voiceless, but to a whole group or class of people that we just did not realize um, were so important in our history of the United States. Um, many of these slaves that were Muslim built the Capitol, the White House. Not only were they making bricks for Evermay Mansion, but they were absolutely critical in creating the infrastructure of the Capitol. So this is taking on all kinds of dimensions that just totally surprised us and that we did not realize. And I have to say, you know, I sound surprised, but that makes it a fantastic project, a really fascinating, engaging research project. So I hope everyone here is as interested or at least intrigued by this um, as much or, well, even a fraction as we were, because it's, uh, we're going to be looking into this project and following up on it for years to come. This is not a little one-hit wonder. So um, the whole story of Yarrow um, is a very powerful way to engage the community. And it's been very successful in engaging the past. Um, and any historian will tell you how difficult it is to research slavery, as there are so few written records. Um, so we have a rich documentary record of the, of the powerful and the elite, but very few written records about the enslaved. So the archaeology that we did actually um, has the potential to give us material remains left behind by the actual people who use them. Uh, we don't have their words, but we have the ability to access the material culture, the things they used. And a lot of times, in a lot of contexts, that gives you so much information about the, the, the individuals. Um, and archaeology often can't focus on the individual, a, a single person at a specific point in time. But here we have a very unique um, opportunity to do something like that. Uh, Yarrow was also um, a, a unique individual because um, um, he was one of the very few enslaved African Americans that sat for a formal portrait or two. Um, and this allows us to put a face on him and the man that we've been excavating, uh, you know, well, his property at any rate. And it's a, a completely unique kind of experience. So uh, the study of archaeology is the study of the past through material remains. And um, we are looking at a relatively recent past, only 200 years old. If you were to go to Europe, they'd be like, pa, we dig through that to get back to the early Roman stuff. Um, it, it's, a, it's a different perspective doing American historical archaeology. Um, and um, we are using the lens of anthropology, the study of all human culture, to address this project. Uh, so historical archaeology specifically de uh, deals with the places, things, and issues from the past or present when written records and oral traditions can inform and contextualize the information. So there are no dinosaurs here. Um, and this is very specifically historical archaeology. And the subfield of that, that is urban archaeology. So not only do we have records and documents, we're also in a highly developed urban context. We've got um, single family homes and row homes all around this property. It's been lived on and redeveloped over 200 years. And so part of our um, trick to this project is teasing out through all of that 
any remains that we can associate with this one person over 200 years ago. So, um, the, and the thing about archaeology is that it's a little bit of storytelling. We can look at these artifacts here in these cases, and I can tell you dates of manufacture, but when we put them in the context where we found them in the ground, we create a story. Who owned them? Why they were there? Why are we finding so many crosses? Uh, some of the things that were analyzed recently are um, charms from um, a rosary. Um, so they weren't, th those artifacts aren't from Yarrow, they're from one of the later property owners. But, um, but we can tell a story about immigrants from Italy who lived on and owned this property at a later time. So there is a bit of a storytelling to what we do as we interpret the remains that we found in the archeological site. It's the, these stories are based on actual evidence um, and it is an evidence-based science. So the four things that we did on this project are the documentary research, uh, the, the map research that we did, historical research, plats, uh, property history, looking at Georgetown records. Uh, it turns out that it's more difficult than you think because Georgetown was part of Montgomery County, Maryland, and before that, Charles County, Maryland, you know, as they started subdividing the counties, a lot of those early records from the early time periods aren't in the district. And Georgetown didn't officially become part of the capital city until the 1870s. So the earlier records are actually in the National Archives. They're not actually in with the rest of the city records. So here we are in our sixth floor office. The surveyor's office is on the third floor below us. There's records office in our buildings for plats and all, across, uh, all kinds of things across the street of the deeds books. None of this information is there. We were just like, ah. Oh. So we ended up having to do research in the National Archives to get local level information just because of the unique history of the district. Um, we did the field investigation. One of my uh, former interns, uh, an AU graduate student, Kevin Bradley, did our initial field work plan, the, the plan for uh, how we were gonna do our investigations, the grid system, where we're gonna do the testing. Um, I make all of the uh, archeological contractors that work in the district do a work plan, why not us? We, we, had, we couldn't be hypocrites there. Uh, the data analysis is ongoing. We um, generated about 30 archival boxes of artifacts in our weeks out at the site, and they, we shipped them off to the University of Florida, and Mia has them in her uh, research lab down there, and they're currently undergoing um, analysis, washing, cataloging, dating, and uh, we have a few here for display, and um, uh, that work, there's still uh, at least five boxes left, and that will take a while to complete. And finally, sharing of the information that we generated on this project through these kinds of conferences, through um, the, the news pieces that we've done, and a report. Um, we won't be able to publish the final results until after all the research and artifact analysis is complete. But uh, that is all ongoing, and someday we'll be able to share this with you. So uh, on your left, you see now there's the, um, uh, the deed of title that Yarrow signed, uh, or rather that uh, when Yarrow signed the property over to his son before his death. And um, we looked at primary records, land records, plats, census information. Um, The, the lot size has not changed. The, the designation of the lot and the square and lot number has changed through time, but this is the same property. We were able to establish that this is the Beatty and Hawkins tract, lot number 217 that Yarrow purchased. And um, the name of the street has changed, a lot of information has changed, but this is definitely the right lot. It, um, it, and this document is important because it conclusively links Yarrow to the property that we ended up digging on all summer. 
So uh, we used historic maps to sort of plot the land use and history through time. And the, um, to your left, to the right, you can see just a series of uh, atlases, uh, various historic atlases and plat maps that show changes in the property. Now, Yarrow built a house on the lot. Uh, we know that uh, because of the, um, of what we see on the deed when he sold the property or gave the property to his son. But that house is not the house that was recently standing on the property. The house that was there is much later. So at some point that house was taken down. Um, and whether that was documented, well, we have not found anything uh, in any of our research to help us understand when that happened. But this is Yarrow's property, 150 feet deep, 35 feet wide, and in 1887, there were two buildings. That is the house, and I'll show you some photos of this, that stood there until, 18, or, uh, until 2013. And you can see there's a, some kind of frame structure in the rear yard. We actually found a building permit for that structure, and it was a coal shed. Um, so they used coal to heat the house. Um, and that went in in 1886, but this is the first a uh, map we have that really clearly shows what was on the property at any given time. And you can see in the center image, the house changed a little. They added an addition on the rear of the house. There's a brick kitchen and bathroom that were added with a little porch. The house itself was framed with a little porch in the front. This is 1924, so there's a lot more information. There's a frame shed in the backyard. And then there's a, a chicken coop or chicken house at the rear of the lot. Um, you see this nice big open yard. Well, I'm gonna bring that up again later. Um, and here we have the property in 1950, another survey plat. And um, so there are, uh, as you can see from these images, there are cycles of land use changes and rebuilding and altering the property through time. So here we have the house that was there in 2013, that was demolished in 2013. In 1978, it was a lovely little Italianate building, a little bit of trim there, but very simple, very tiny, with this little tiny porch on the front. You can see down the, the lot, there's an op uh, area between it and the house next door. Um, but it is cheek by jowl to the house on the other side. This is what it looked like in 2008. And see these branches at the top of the 1978 image? Well, that is from a big giant oak tree that in one of the big storms that came through fell over and crushed the house, crushed the second story in. And you can see that the result is the blue tarp. Uh, the property owner had already moved out of the house um, and she left it like this for several years. And I should say here that the property owner gave us permission to do the project. Her name is Margaret Cheney, and we thank her very much for allowing us to do this uh, project. Otherwise, it, pro private property would have never been able to do it. But um, as you can see, the uh, blue tarp sat on the house for several years um, while she decided what to do. And finally, the city came in um, and raised it as a blighted property. So we were able to start the project after that happened. Um, let's just say the neighborhood was very supportive of our project. <laughs> so the first thing we did after all this happened is we got in there um, and we, uh, after they demolished the house, and we got in there and we cleaned up the lot. We had to take down the brush. Uh, he had sat there after the house was demolished for oh, a good summer and a half, overgrown, um, just, I mean, it was crazy. So um, we got in, we had the Urban Archaeology Corps help us clean up the lot, and then we started our project. Uh, one of the first things we did is we had a geoarchaeologist come in who did a soil core, and you can see over here, He's doing a manual soil coring in the backyard, and he's laying out each section of the soil as it comes out of the core. And this is the full core. And you can see this bright orange stuff. This is uh, deep 
subsoil. It's highly clayey. And as you can see, this right here is the topsoil. And then there's this sort of medium orange. And then there's this very dark black. Well, this dark black is the original ground surface. And uh, the thing I haven't told you yet is in 1986, the property owner put in an in-the-ground swimming pool. You know that big area behind the house? So it turns out that we were looking at a much smaller part of the lot than is available, than it looks like on a map. Um, it, so it's very sad. So at the very back of the yard, there's this brick retaining wall. And we had about 35 feet between that rear of the lot and the swimming pool that was our main focus for this project. So, and you can see in the image on your left that there is, um, we're looking, standing at the front of that, looking in, and that is the swimming pool enclosure. And on either side, there's just a narrow alley. And we were primarily working in the rear of that where this area in the front is where the house stood. And uh, we started our project by doing a systematic shovel test grid over the property. Um, we laid out a grid um, and we dug shovel tests, which are small shovel, manually excavated test units, just a, the width of a shovel wide. And um, you can see um, at some points, they're actually using a trowel because they hit the brick deposit. When they bulldoze the house, they just spread the rubble all around. So before we could get down to the yard deposits, we had to get through that. That was pretty much a, a, it was a big challenge. Um, and uh, uh, the shovels went out the window. Um, and you can see Charday is in the top right. She actually was able to get some traction in one of the shovel tests. But she will tell you that in the front yard where the rubble was, that was hard going. So we um, definitely hit the remains of the house. But in other parts of the yard, we got um, intact soils. We got intact soil columns where there were archaeological deposits. And so we were very happy. Here's an example of what a shovel test looks like. And you could see the soil layers and the different color changes as you get deeper. So we recorded all of that. And here we are digging one in the very back at the retaining wall at the very back corner of the lot. Now let me go back. One thing I forgot to say was the lot slopes. This is upper Georgetown. Everything is oriented, sloping down to the Potomac River. So there's a slope from north to south, but also from east to west. So the far southeast corner over here on the lot, at the very deep end, is almost, I would say, four and a half feet below the street level of the lot at the front, 150 feet away. And that has a lot of implications for the landscape history of the property. No, so one of the things we're looking for in all of this is we're trying to come down on trash deposits, intact soil levels where people walked, but also the middens or trash deposits of the people that lived in the house. And those are the kind of things, the actual items that people use and discard, the food remains of what they ate that are really interesting to archaeologists. So this is what we're looking for. So based on the, the results of the shovel test, we knew we needed to focus on the backyard. So we ended up putting a test unit in. Uh, this is our first real big test unit. It's five by five feet square. And it's, uh, that's me with digging over there. And it's right where all those cinder blocks are. It's in the very southwest corner of the property or southeast corner of the property in what would have originally been the lowest spot. And what our test unit showed us is that there is a huge potential for stratigraphic deposits layered up through time on this property. Um, we never reached subsoil in that unit. It was only uh, five feet by five feet. And once you get down over four feet, you have to worry about the walls caving in. So we, you know, have to worry about OSHA and those kind of things. And we didn't have a lot of ability to step back the trench. So for every foot that you deep, dig deeper, you have to step the trench back. So if it collapses, you can scramble out. So once we got down to four feet and we pushed it a little to five, we were still in 
deposits that were trash deposits and soil deposits that had built up in this southeast corner of the lot in the last 200 years. And we were getting, you know, down around four feet, we're getting older stuff, older, early um, 19th century, but we still didn't hit subsoil. So we had to stop that because it was unsafe. So then um, we just really had to turn around and, and rethink this. So um, the next thing we did was using the funds raised by the neighbors, we rented a backhoe and an operator. Uh, and the, they came out and based on the results of our shovel tests and test units, we were able to dig out a large area of the backyard uh, adjacent to where that test was. And you can see behind the little mini backhoe, the swimming pool enclosure. Looking, and that is looking north to the front of the lot. So we call this area the bathtub. We dug a, some 20 by 20 area down uh, all of that. Um, uh, this is what I forgot to say. Swimming pool. You dig a big in the ground swimming pool. What do you do with all the dirt? Nobody wants to pay to take the dirt away. So they smudged it all in the back of the lot, leveling it out somewhat. So, you know, I said that southeast corner was almost four feet lower. Well, today it is a little lower, but not four feet. They just smudged that pool fill all over. So in order to get down to that, those de yard deposits in the backyard, we had to take almost three feet of pool fill off. And it was hard clay, a lot of it. It was subsoil from that deep part of the deep end of the pool. It was nasty. So fortunately, our friendly backhoe operator was able to remove all that. And we built up a ginormous backhoe pile. And um, it just made it so much easier to lay out units and get right into the archaeological deposits. The other thing the backhoe was really helpful for was looking at the uh, landscape history of the property. I mentioned it had been filled. So not only was there pool fill, but in the last 200 years, other people were bringing in dirt and smudging it around the yard to level it because it was so sloped. So um, in this photo on the bottom, you can see in the front yard, the evidence of all of those layers of the, this crazy landscape history we discovered, and including a foot thick layer of coal ash. So at some point, somebody, we don't know if, if it would originated on the property or where it came from, there is this thick layer of coal ash. And it does not cover the whole property, just one part of the lot. So we're, we'd still like to figure out where that originated from and why it's just in that area. Now, I'm going to come back to this in a moment. But you have that coal ash. And then you have another two and a half feet of other soils layered on top. And here's Chardet in one of our other backhoe trenches. And so you can see the tape. Uh, that's Charlie Lee Decker. And we're recording those strata. Uh, as we try to puzzle all of this out, that information will be very important to us. So from there, we had that area in the backyard opened up that I call the bathtub. And it's two to three feet lower than the rest of the area. And once, once we opened up our units, every night when we were done, we had to cover it with plastic tarps. Uh, we, we bought a giant roll of plastic sheeting that was 100 feet long, and we just kept rolling that baby out, and every day we'd have to weight the edges, and every time it rained, we spent the first couple of hours bailing that thing out, and it is the low spot on the yard. And um, I just have to say, earthworms after a rain, ugh, I, the smell still haunts me. We, we hit earthworm central here. So we started out by laying units in a grid pattern. And then as we started finding features, we started excavating each unit in between those test units. You know, you find something and it continues in the next one and then you have to open that one up and it just went on and on and on. Till finally we opened up, uh, we, we got through the letter R. No, at T. We went through the letter T in the alphabet. Each one had an alpha um, um, in, in number on it. So, and these are just some of the in-process shots. 
and you could see our plastic in the backyard. And we had volunteers come out, um, as many of you know. And um, it, it took quite a while to do this. Um, so you can see the layers of fill here that we had to remove by the backhoe, and this is a surface. There's a little bit of protective layer. And then as we open the units up, they're nice and square, as you can see. And you can see even in the walls, there's evidence of strata. There's evidence of features. And there's a whole lot going on here. The uh, gentleman here, you can see in front of him, there's a little circular feature with brick and stone. Uh, there is a lot going on. So features are non-portable archaeological remains, like building foundations, wells, fences, uh, fence posts, trash pits, and walkways, all kinds of things like that. So essentially what we were here, doing here is chasing these features in the rear yard. And we just continued to, to do that until uh, we ran out of time, we ran out of uh, deposits, and um, winter came. Uh, so essentially what happened is we were able to document in this very comp uh, complicated landscape. And um, so remember this image because this is that trench in the front yard with the coal ash. And well, I'm going to bring that up in a second. Um, we tested 10 feet away from that with a backhoe a few weeks later and got completely different soils. And so that's one of the things I love about urban archaeology. Um, you can be on a site that looks completely disturbed, like this one does over there, but still find small pockets where the landscape is well preserved and intact. We were still looking for Yarrow. We had not found him. So we brought in ground penetrating radar. We thought if there is a, if there is a, uh, a burial or a coffin or a shaft to put a burial in, that that would leave a trace in the soils that ground penetrating radar could perhaps find. Um, and the problem here that we found out um, is that the fill, the fill just killed our hopes. Um, and the GPR consultant told that, that us that that would likely be a, a problem. Um, and um, it's the, the, the ground penetrating radar is based on the soil resistivity. And the site's clay soils also uh, really uh, were not conducive to fine grain results in order to locate a burial. So um, this is what was generated. This is a preliminary uh, map of the site. Uh, and this is only on the front yard. So the street would have been here. And this is where that former house was. And you can see at two feet below ground surface, this is what the results were. The red is uh, brick and um, impenetrable debris. And as you get further down, this is the second one on the bottom, is four feet below the ground surface. And you can really see this is the cellar hole of the former house. It had a small cellar, and it's just they literally crushed the house into that hole. So not very helpful. We, there were a few other little anomalies, but they did not pan out. We did look at them, and it just, it just was not helpful. And so we really were just relying on our excavations to look for, the, um, look for Yarrow's remains. So here we are, um, we brought the backhoe in a second time. That long trench with the coal ash is, would have been, was parallel to the house next door right over there. And 10 feet away from that, we hit completely intact soil. That trench ended right here. Here we are. This is intact backyard. It's just crazy. So that three and a half, four feet, all those stratified layers and coal ash, right over there. We have no idea why. Um, so one of, this is our, uh, one of our things that we learned is that urban lots, even a little house like this, a tiny little property, people are constantly doing things to it. 
So what kind of things did we find out there? Lots of architectural features and pits. There must have been a fence in the backyard. You saw the map with the chicken coop. We think they probably fenced that in at some point uh, so the chickens could run around. We found uh, lots of post holes with rocks or brick in the bottom that you would have wedged in there to hold the post up before you backfilled it. Um, and as you can see in this one, there's different colored soil here. You get the rocks. And then you get the soil build up over top after the post was pull pulled out. Um, this is a really interesting feature. It's a wood box. One of the things we're going to do is do an animation showing the excavation of that. We don't know what this is. This went down into intact subsoil. It was a wood box about one foot by one foot. It had a lid but no bottom. There was really nothing in it. And we took all of the fill out of it in one um, uh, completely excavated and save that and we're going to have that analyzed. Um, you know people have privies, they have wells and cisterns in their backyard but this is one foot square. We have no idea what it is and when we first encountered it it was in a unit that ended right about here. Or, I'm sorry right about here you can see the line right there. And we thought, oh my gosh, we have the foot of a coffin. We found Yarrow. So in order, and because the unit ended here, in order to see if we had a coffin, we had to open up the bathtub. We had to make it bigger. We had no backhoe. The backhoe couldn't get there. It was blocked by our ginormous back dirt pile. So we got the volunteers and shovels, and we put in another unit that was six feet long by three feet wide. So that took three days. And then we had to excavate those two units. And then we started finding all these features, other post holes, other things to work on, all the layers to take off to get down to this. And then after three weeks, it went into that other unit, four inches. So it's like, ugh. But in, in some ways, I'm relieved that it was not a coffin. I always had, uh, I was always, worried and, um, and did not really want to disturb Yarrow if we found him. Um, but we did not find him, and this was not a coffin. So that was somewhat of a relief. Um, on the other hand, we never did find a burial or a coffin for Yarrow. So, um, and we ended up bringing the backhoe back later. And uh, at the second time, and we dug... Um, I'm sorry, we brought the backhoe back a third time to backfill the bathtub unit when we were finished and also to look in other areas of the yard that we hadn't gotten into uh, on the perimeter and in the front and we never did find a trace of Yarrow, uh, of his coffin or a burial. And so I go back to the swimming pool in the middle of the lot. Um, we did find a lot. Um, we have lots of artifacts from the 19th century, from all the families that live there. We have um, ceramics and bottles and food remains. We have the family dog. It had a nylon collar, but it was a full intact dog burial. Um, so the artifacts are currently being processed. And if you're interested and you want to keep up with the project, uh, there are handouts here, and there's also a sheet with a, with a little QR code. If you have a smartphone, you can put that in. It'll take you right to the Facebook page. And Mia from Florida is updating that with an artifact of the day. So you can see what's coming out. And she's posting questions. You know, if you know what something is, you might be able to tell her. But this is going to go on for a while. Um, as of, um, we talked with her yesterday. So over 10,000 artifacts have been processed as of yesterday. And um, they just ranged the gamut. Here's a, a lovely little doll leg with a painted on garter. And we have an example of that here. Um, lots and lots of marbles. And all I can say is, I guess that's what people did before TV. We found dozens in, of marbles, glass, clay, porcelain, all different colors and sizes. And um, as I mentioned, the lot was sloped, so I just have to think that they were rolling in the backyard. Uh, we have toy soldiers. Um, 
Oh, there he is, over there. And it looks like a, a nice World War II soldier. Um, so there's a wide variety of things. We have a dog tag from um, 1912 for DC. So that was, you know, they, these people followed the law. They had a tag dog. So ultimately, uh, we brought in um, one of our um, friends who did some photogrammetry with 3D. Um, and it was just the coolest thing. He just walked around and took pictures and then was able to stitch them together in this great overview. And you can see some of our units. This is in the bathtub. We cropped out most of the edges. So you just see a little bit of the edge of our bathtub unit and our test units and how we started with a, 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 a checkerboard and we just kept expanding as we got features a drainage trench, here's where the wood box was, this is where we expanded that, and you can see that this is subsoil and it's sloping down this way. Everything slopes down to that corner. Finally, we had a lot of um, public participation to make all this happen, and it turns out that even though we finished the field work, and backfilled all these units, we still have so much to do. There's still so many questions to be answered. So this historical research is ongoing. Um, lots of public engagement. We did site tours. Uh, we gave tours twice a day. We did the Islamic funeral prayer that one of the local mosques uh, wanted to know if we'd be interested in having a funeral prayer recited for Yarrow. There's, we have no information on whether he, there was an imam available in Georgetown when he was buried, if there was any kind of prayer said for him. So uh, one of our research uh, partners is a PhD student at Howard University who's studying Muslim slaves and slavery in America. And he's a member of this mosque, and he hooked us up and set it all up. And um, the imam came out one Friday afternoon and did this funeral prayer. He brought some international visitors from Senegal. Um, and we had over 100 people out there for this event. And I'm going to try. So ultimately, the um, Islamic funeral prayer was very successful. And it really helped us um, connect with the, um, the, the Muslim community and sort of focused our research and made us realize how important this was. In this time of ISIS and terrorism, to have the Muslim history in the United States pushed back to the very founding and making people realize how um, important they were, um, to, I mean, it was like a revelation for us. I had no idea. It really was something special. And the community was so grateful. They were just so pleased to have a positive story. Here they are, they've been here for over 200 years. And um, to, to actually have someone that, that focused on this, they, they, it, it couldn't have been a better event. Now the other thing is, people forget that the Georgetown uh, history is very much uh, a history of African Americans. There was a huge African American community there from the very founding of both slaves and free blacks um, at, the very, at the very founding. So um, that history is sort of lost today. People have forgotten about it. And um, so we're sort of bringing that back to the community. Um, so overall, it was just an amazing experience. We had a ton of press. Um, and in fact, we were on Fox News a couple of weeks ago. There, 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I'm sure you saw it. Um, but it, it's just good to get out there and do that kind of thing. We have a, uh, a lot of social media going on, so please look, at us, look us up if you're interested in keeping up with the artifacts and things we're finding. Mia has a blog on the project um, that's uh, sort of uh, to keep people informed of the research issues and things. So uh, come up and get a handout. And um, if you have any questions, you can, we're running out of time and I apologize, I can go on and on. But please come and ask us questions, come see the artifacts, grab a handout, and um, follow us. Um, we're, we're happy to talk to you about it. And if you have a interest in researching this on your own, let us know and we can give you some ideas or, or additional subjects. The whole subjects of slaves, um, 
Yarrow was a slave of the Bell family here in Montgomery County, and they also had property up at Catoctin Furnace. He was there for years, and we think that's where he might have met George Washington. So there are all these connections in this region that this is not just a DC story, this is a regional story, a national story, and it's international in scope. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate your attention and time. <laughs>